It is February the 15th, 2021, and this is Curiously Polar. And we're back with another episode. Uh, I'm Chris, and this is Henry. Uh, this is Henry. <laughs> um, never get the pointing thing right. How are you doing, Henry? I'm doing great. I'm finally enjoying some <laughs> proper winter here uh, in Transylvania. How about you? Yeah, proper winter still here. There's supposed to be some rain in the afternoon. Um, and then pro probably some of that snow will turn into ice and mush and whatever. But um, we've had a whole bunch of winter days now, like a week of uh, heavy snow and really cold, crisp temperatures, minus 20, over, under minus 20 Celsius. So, wow. Very unusual for up here, and uh, I I really enjoy that. You know, you know I like the cold climates. So it's like, and it is how 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 winter used to be in in uh, northern Germany. At least everything um, was better when we were kids. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't go that far, but uh, that's also what I remember when I was smaller. We had some winter with uh, yeah. actually snow, and. When you heard stories from uh, grandparents and parents, and in they the had olden days. much more regular snow and stuff. Yeah. But we are we're going to talk about that today a little bit more in detail. Yeah, we have uh, some stuff to talk about for sure, um, and that includes uh, the weather. Before that, let's do our now regular news segment. Um, we we, we kind of need a jingle for that. <laughs> it's the news. <laughs> no, wait, wait. We we need something that goes dim, 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 like a little news marimbas. Yes. Yeah. Um. Anyway, just imagine this being here. So uh, we had a uh, we have our our correspondents. We have a network of correspondents now. One being Robert uh, Spagiari. Spagiari. I still don't know how to pronounce it, but he's uh, he's now officially our American correspondent, and uh, he sent us. A link to a video by uh, Cyrus Videos, and it is, um, let me bring it up here, it is a video about the Mosaic Mission, and it's a really good video about the Mosaic vision, uh, Mission. It's actually um, about the first lag, so in the very yeah. beginning, when um, um, the, the polar stand was just going into the ice, you can see how it's um, made ready here in Tromsø, and then departure yeah. and looking for the right ice flow. Exactly. And and that's just a very, very um, interesting and important time. You can see how logistics are going behind the scenes, everything that nobody really ever sees. And this is kind of a little bit a bit behind the scenes look um, of that huge it's great. research expedition. And it is it's also, amazing. It's also really well produced. So it, it's, it's not just like someone put a camera somewhere and then and, and, and it's a long boring documentary no they have really done a great job um putting all this together um i've i've uh i would highly recommend to watch it it's very exciting to watch um i've also looked into who made that and it's the cyrus the cooperative institute for research and environmental sciences which again is um a partnership between the NOAA and the university <laughs> of colorado in boulder and the NOAA, again, is um, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, which is a U.S. department. And it's a part or it's a U.S. organization. And that is part of the U.S. Department of Commerce, which is interesting. So <laughs> so what, what they do is um, um, they, they claim they do daily weather forecasts and storm warnings and climate monitoring uh, up to fisheries management and coastal restoration. And um, it's pretty much information for decision makers. Um, and it has a, a commercial slant, but they also support um, things like Cyrus, which uh, does a lot of research in that. And Noah has a, a big archive of uh, climate change research yes. Um, yes. on its own. That's that's a pretty pretty good database. Yeah. So um, that was that. Watch the video. We'll definitely link that in the show notes. Um, the other piece of information is, of of course, um, it's, it's getting <laughs> less and less newsworthy. But we'll uh, just briefly revisit A sixty eight, the iceberg. Um, I think it's it's not getting less newsworthy. It's just 
It's right getting now, smaller and smaller the, and more and more pieces. So that's that's the one thing. The other thing is that the big mass media is just um, going away from the topic. It's just not as interesting anymore. It's not as, as it's, imposing anymore. Exactly. It's not threatening um, South Georgia that much anymore. But if you scroll a little bit to the right of the of the so um, you've you've the, dug up a graphic. chart here which shows us like a, a timeline where it moved and then we are and this, this is where it's beginning to break up. So. And you see um, this, the, the shape of the iceberg, the outlines of the iceberg yeah. and the different colors. And the yellow one is from the 1st of February. So that's like the latest um, we we got as uh, data, as, as yeah, graphically enhanced data set. After that, that's a little bit, yeah, a bit lacking because now, as I said, the interest for mass media is not that much anymore. So it's not updated on a daily basis any longer. But you can see it's fragmenting into smaller pieces. And when we say smaller pieces, please be they're careful. They're not small. They're still <laughs> huge, exactly. They're larger than uh, ship size. But British Antarctic Survey arrived in South Georgia on the 2nd of February. And um, you just started with the uh, mission to actually investigate the impact of the freshwater emerging into the ecosystem of South Georgia. And um, yeah, they're using the uh, research vessel, uh, James Clark Ross. I'm, I'm really curious about the outcome there. So a lot of scientists, which usually would use satellite data and remote data um, to, to yeah, execute their research, have a chance to actually go into the field um, due to Corona or despite Corona and just go into the area where this huge iceberg um, is just yeah, fragmenting. And you can also see a little bit and can see how the, the, the large iceberg just um, drifted much, much further to the southeast. And now it gets a little bit tricked in the currents and um, goes along the southern polar front, along the southeastern edge of South Georgia, drifting slowly and steadily to the north, into the North Atlantic, yeah. where it eventually will just yeah, dissolve apart, entirely. Apart from the defragment, which here uh, is actually has landed on South Georgia up here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, cool. So that's our update on A68. Um, and then we also have a uh, nice correspond cor correspondence with our um, Chilean correspondent, Guillermo. Hello, Guillermo. Thanks for your mails, um, who sent us a few really interesting um, topic suggestions. So there's definitely something in there. And this is a call for everyone here to, uh, if you have interesting things that we might talk about here that would interest you uh, for us to dig in, I'm um, I'm pretty sure that uh, either Henry or I, probably more Henry, is going to find uh, uh, find them interesting enough, or some of them interesting enough to spend time and to uh, really research some of that. So, um, yeah, definitely bring them on. We are online at curiouslypolar.com, and uh, we'll we'll we're happy to hear from you. And uh, you know, what's, it's interesting. Chile is, has been on my radar lately or has been brought to my attention because I don't know how it is. You know, sometimes you, you hear something, you see something, and then you all of a sudden see a lot of it. And you don't know if that's a, a bias because you've been dealing with something um, or if it just a big coincidence. But I recently came across, and this is, this is not polar related whatsoever, <laughs> but I recently came across um, a radio feature here on German radio about project cybersin which is is, is, is 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 this goes back to the to chile in uh, in early in the early 70s during the presidency of salvador allende um, i'm reading from wikipedia here and that was a project aiming at constructing a distributed decision support system to aid in the management of the national economy that was back in um, well right before well, right when Chile was a socialist country and uh, right before the CIA-backed military coup in 1973 um, stopped all that, including Project Cybersyn and the way they, they, um, they built on or they tried to build on uh, cybernetic principles to organize something with computers and stuff. And that was in the early 70s. Um, that was a super interesting story so if you're interested in that certainly 
something to look into. Again, not polar related whatsoever, but um, it really caught my interest. So um, I, I got a pretty interesting history lesson there just out of nowhere. And the IT nerd here is speaking. Well, it is, it's, not a, <laughs> it's not really IT related. That's the thing. 1971, there wasn't such a thing as computers everywhere. So um, instead of that, they had a central command center and all the lines to the outside were fed by telex systems. So the information <laughs> flow was handled with the telex, which the younger, the, the younger amongst our listeners will probably not even know what that is. Um, <laughs> grandpa One talking picture. about old old technology. <laughs> um, so let's see. I have um, come across something in the news recently and um, then uh, Henry decided to make this into an episode because it is a really interesting thing. Um, and it has to do with our current uh, winter temperatures here. Because uh, we, again, we had, we had this much snow. If you're listening to the podcast, uh, let me say this is like 30, 40, sometimes 50 centimeters of snow. So uh, it's a sizable amount of snow. And it's turned really cold here, uh, unusually cold. Again, some nights uh, under minus 21 um, Celsius. I'm just doing the conversion here. That's minus 5, minus 6 Fahrenheit. So it really went low. And, um, and then uh, I saw this news article and it said the polar vortex has broken down. And that's the reason for it. <laughs> well, and the news are the news, okay? They will, they will make things sound uh, more dangerous. Exciting. The, the title, well, they, they, they didn't say it has broken down. They say there's an anomaly in the polar vortex. And um, let me translate here. An um, unusual, un unusually heavy um, lowering of the polar vortex that would explain our big snowfall and the temperature drop here. So, um, Henry, you decided we'll talk about the polar vortex. What is this whole thing about? Give us a, a bit of a, a weather insight. We're not meteorologists, but I think um, you have really looked into this for a long time already. It's, it's very important. We're not meteorologists. We're not physicists. So we're not atmospheric scientists. So everything we do here is just by some research. And obviously, there are experts out, uh, out there and if we do something wrong, just come back and just um, tell, tell us, us and, we will, and we will correct ourselves. But um, what we're going to um, do today is we dive a little bit into what is the polar vortex and build a little bit the background of that. Because to understand the polar vortex, we also need to understand atmospheric um, behavior, atmospheric patterns. So we dive a little bit into that as well. And then we try to yeah get an idea of what's so special in this year what was special in the past years and what's the outlook and where do we end up and if you just follow news in the past years uh, you might have recognized that the buzzword of polar vortex has been making the rounds um, mainly in the north american media where particularly in the past few like four or five years a big um yeah event in early winter happened on the east coast and usually was referred to to the polar, uh, polar vortex and this kind of event has usually caused uh, climate change skeptics to ask about uh, the oh so uh, warmer climate when a sudden cold snap um, just hits north america so where is the climate change when there's when it's getting so much colder on the east coast so years after years those extremes have accumulated and Meanwhile, not only affect North America, but this year, and that's the special thing, also Northern and Central Europe. So what exactly is hidden under that buzzword and why does it affect our weather so far away from the poles? So the, the, the name polar vortex got first described in 1853. So it's quite a long time ago. It's already quite a well-known and well-defined um feature and it is defined as a upper level low pressure high speed wind system that's a lot of words in here and we dive into that just in a minute this system that forms during winter in the northern hemisphere and rotates eastwards around the poles so it goes from west to east 
opposite to the direction the Earth is spinning because it's driven by the Coriolis effect. So it runs in the north counterclockwise, counterclockwise, and in the south clockwise. Because obviously, if you just have the globe um, in front of you, the, on the top of the Arctic and the bottom of the Antarctic, they go both in the, in the same direction. But when you look from the top, then one goes counterclockwise in the north and the other one in the south goes clockwise. When the vortex of the Arctic is strong, it is a very, very well defined um, system, a very uh, defined um, kind of a, of a cyclone. And there is a single vortex very well defined in the middle with a jet stream that is well constrained near the polar front and the Arctic air is contained in there. There are a lot of terms in here, and I will explain the terms just in a, in a minute, particularly what the jet stream actually is and what Arctic air actually is. But <clears throat> we have a, a first graphic. So if you're just listening on the podcast, just swap over to YouTube and have a look. Because when the northern uh, vortex weakens, which is generally, um, it, it happens very, very often, it will break into two or more smaller vortices. Mm -hmm. the by the, way, by the way, for those only listening, we will, of course, link all these <coughs> graphics as well. So you can uh, follow those uh, without the video, just letting you know, but we are looking at pictures now. Sure. Um, so we have actually like two globes here on, on the screen from, uh, it's a graphic from NOAA. And on the left side, you can see uh, a classical stable polar vortex in the north. You see the, the white band with the blue arrows, that's the, the, the jet stream that actually um, creates the border and, and, and capsules the cold Arctic air. The cold Arctic air circles creates this kind of a cyclone type uh, weather system. That's the polar vortex. That's so the, the vortex is like a big, vortex. big, um, well, a vortex. It, 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 it turns around in exactly. circles and, and pretty much stays up there normally. Normally, exactly. So in, um, in special occasions, it turns uh, weaker and then it breaks into smaller vortices. The strongest of those smaller vortices usually is happening near Baffin Island in Canada because that's where the, the coldest part in the Arctic is apart from the sea ice, where we have the input coming from uh, Ellesmere Island, from Greenland and from Baffin Island, and there um, traps a uh, little weather system there. Then we have um, one more in northeast Siberia. That's like the typical two vortices we're talking about when the big one just breaks up into two. And then it becomes more and more disorganized and masses of cold Arctic air can push more towards the equator, bringing rapid and sharp temperature drops usually. But why do we have suddenly um, snow in Spain and at the same time, freezing cold temperatures in North America. That's the unusual fact, and that's the big question right now happening. And it seems very paradoxical. We have a global warming, and at the same time, we have unusually strong winter cold in uh, recent years. So the Arctic air penetrates much, much further than usual into middle lat latitudes of both Europe and North America. And in the last few weeks, this has led to heavy snowfall in uh, many parts of Europe, as you've experienced in, in, in Germany, but at the same time also in the US and even further down towards Spain. Spain was completely overwhelmed by the mass of snow that just went down there. The whole infrastructure was just not ready for that, not built for that. They haven't had that for quite some time. So right now, there is a cold snap. Um, especially in the northeastern US, but also in Europe. And as satellite measurements reveals, this kind of freak weather of the last few weeks, this is due to an extraordinary disturbance of the polar vortex. So we have kind of um, a kind of a generally weakening process of the vortex. So it uh, is strongest in the middle of winter and then it weakens. So it actually um, extends further south. But this is a very extraordinary one because it is in the middle of uh, winter. And here is something that's called the Berlin phenomenon or the sudden stratospheric warming. And there the polar stratosphere suddenly warms up by dozens of degrees. And we're talking here 
up to 50, 65 degrees centigrade. So that's quite something. On these impressive fluid dynamical events, um, in which large and rapid temperature increases in the winter polar stratosphere are the are associated with um, a complete reversal of the westerly uh, of the westerly winds, and this breaks down the wind barrier that normally keeps the Arctic air away from the mid latitudes, and then of course cold air can penetrate further south. That sounds very very abstract. So let's have a quick look into the Earth atmosphere first. So we have very um, well-defined atmosphere layers and they have very distinct features and we describe the layer um, of atmospheres as gas layers that surround the planet and they're commonly known as air the, those gases it's a mixture that has a, a very well-defined average but each and every layer has of course a different density of that air the earth atmosphere is a very very thin envelope of gases surrounding the solid planet and the hydrosphere and biosphere is basically what we have on the crust that's basically where we live on and from there on the atmosphere starts and the atmosphere makes life possible by creating pressure and this pressure allows allows for liquid water to exist on the surface only by the atmosphere pressure this can stay on the planet and that's a pretty pretty amazing uh, feature at the same time the atmosphere is absorbing ultraviolet solar radiation it's warming the surface through heat retention that's what we call the greenhouse effect that's currently more under observation in terms of global warming and at the same time it's reducing temperature extremes between day and night because it stores some of the heat and releases that during the night when there is no impact from the sun. The composition of the atmosphere consists largely of two basic elements. That's oxygen and nitrogen. That's what we know from basic school. By volume, dry air contains about 78% nitrogen and about 21% oxygen, less than 1% argon, and 0.04% carbon dioxide and a small amount of other gases as well. So when we talk about um, carbon dioxide being a very important greenhouse gas in having that in the entire atmosphere present just 0.04%, that gives you an idea how much the effect of those carbon dioxide molecules are compared to the others. The atmosphere of course also contains other chemicals which absorb heat from their surface and radiate that in all kind of direction this results in the already mentioned greenhouse effect and the greenhouse gases include of course water vapor which on average is around one percent of the atmosphere at sea level and 0.4 percent over the entire atmosphere then of course carbon dioxide and, and methane the atmosphere grows thinner so it turns less dense and lower in pressure as one moves from the surface up to the sky into into space if you like and it gradually gives way to the vacuum of outer space so we have the pressure that keeps the gases and the water together and the further you move away from from crust or from the crust of earth the um the, the more it gives way to the vacuum and Should we have a look at this at this one graphic that shows us that uh, transition? Please, I found I found this really interesting. So. Um, <laughs> what, what, if you're looking at this, what you're seeing is a very thin line, which is kind of a, a cut through our atmosphere. And let me let me zoom in here. So um, all the way to the bottom here, that's the troposphere. Um, and it, it has also levels in there. So the troposphere, like to 8 to 15 kilometers, and then the stratosphere, and then the mesosphere, and whatever they are called. And then comes this long, 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 long blue line, which we call the thermosphere. And then we end up being in outer space, the exosphere. I mean, and it's, it's just it's, amazing it's, it's to open. see. It's open to the top. There yes. is no limit in this graphic to the top. And we we, we talked about this a bit a when debate. when we talked about the satellites because um, exactly they, they even even at 
five, six, seven hundred kilometers up there, they will still experience a little bit of drag because there is still uh, atmosphere up there. Exactly. So there is still quite some debate how far the um, outer layer of the atmosphere actually reaches into the space. What you will find is something around 10,000 kilometers, which is kind of the, the upper limit of that. And um, right now we have a graphic on screen and that's pretty awesome. If you could zoom in a little bit, what we see here are not only the different uh, layers of the atmosphere, they are not in scale though, but you also see this red zigzag line and that is pretty amazing. You have the different atmosphere layers and the temperature behaves differently in those different layers. In the troposphere, the oh, so, general So rule the, the says, red line, the more to the left, the colder, and the more to the right, the warmer. Exactly. So the general rule says in the troposphere, the higher you climb up in altitude, the colder it gets. So you actually have a decline of temperature. In the tropopause, in a tropopause, which is like the 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 layer between troposphere and stratosphere it's not really a layer it's more really like the the um the zone where both merge into each other there we have a, a turnaround and then in the stratosphere so it, at one point it gets warmer the higher you go exactly in the stratosphere it gets warmer the further up you climb in altitude and at the stratopause, the end of the stratosphere, that turns around again. And that's actually the indicator for scientists to separate the atmosphere layers because the temperature behaves distinct distinctively different here from layer to layer. The mesosphere, the higher you get up, the colder it gets. And then in the thermosphere, the reason why it's called that is because it gets incredibly hot there. And when I say incredibly hot, it gets up to 1,200 degrees. So it's really a temperature that's off the chart what? here. Wait, but you can I didn't know <laughs> that. 1,200 degrees up in the in the thermosphere at, uh, I don't know, yeah. 200, 300, 400, 500, 600 kilometers up there. That it's, is incredible. Uh, it's, between, it's between 80 and 700 kilometers. So that gives you also an idea <laughs> when uh, space shuttles are entering um, atmosphere, the atmosphere again, that's when they start uh, glowing. When uh, when you when you have the the, the heat shield of the uh, of the space shuttle coming to uh, into play into action, it's not only the friction of the atmosphere; it's also the temperatures in the um, uh, thermosphere. It's you see really me you see me with a wide open mouth here because this is I did not totally not know that. This is so hot up there. It really baffled me as well. It's it's just really incredible uh, what we don't know in uh, like basic school um, about our. No one told me. <laughs> I blame my teacher. No one told me. <laughs> wow. And so far, this has nothing to do with the polar region. That's just like general atmosphere setup. So this is just pretty um, uh, in, in, uh, in impressive. And just to give you an idea. The axosphere reaches roughly into an altitude of 10,000 kilometers. Just to give you a scale, the radius of Earth equator is 3,963 miles, 6,378 kilometers. So 6,000 kilometers and then 10,000 kilometers again on top as... The, the the, the, the atmosphere. But the, temp the temperature goes down again, right? Because uh, I, I, I've... I, I hear about the cold vacuum of space, so there must be <laughs> some place where the temperature, temperature drops it's, again. Yes, exactly. Okay. So thermosphere is the second highest um, uh, atmosphere layer, and then you have axosphere where wow. the temperature drops again. Yes, and then it drops even further when you leave the atmosphere. This is what we particularly um, have in mind when we talk about atmosphere, even though most people only have the troposphere and the stratosphere in mind when talking about atmosphere. And this is, as we see here, not quite right because the particulars of the atmosphere, they um, they happen for the entire range of those five layers, and not only for the uh, bottom two. But the troposphere is a very important one, and that's why we have a quick look in the particulars 
of the troposphere. So it's the lowest layer of Earth atmosphere and, and contains most of the mass of the atmosphere. When we talk about mass of atmosphere, that's very difficult to grasp because atmosphere contains of gases. But we talk about 75 to 80 percent of the entire mass of the atmosphere, which is tra uh, trapped in the troposphere. And on the picture, <clears throat> in, on the picture on the uh, on the screen, we actually see the orange right, uh, reddish layer, and this is actually the um it's a troposphere it, it ends abruptly in the tropos uh, tropo pores that's the very thin um pink part on uh on top of the red orange one it's the, the the boundary and then you have the blue colored um uh, stratosphere on top of it so you see the moon basically shining through the stratosphere it's pretty amazing how thin the troposphere is compared to the planet and when you when you look from it uh, from from space at it, it's just really incredible to see how small the atmosphere or thin the atmosphere actually is, and how big the effects is of uh, of our impact on this um, atmosphere level uh, layer. The name troposphere it comes from the Greek word tropos, which means turn or turn towards something, and that reflects the fact that we have rotational turbulent mixing um, into play here. And they play in a very important role in the, in the structure and the behavior of this atmospheric layer. And most types of clouds we have on Earth are found in that particular layer. So up to 10, 11 kilometers um, altitude. And almost all day-to-day -day weather occurs in this layer. This is one of the most important facts. Of course, it contains the vast majority of the mass of the atmosphere. So this is also, when we randomly talk about the atmosphere, that is very likely the atmosphere layer. We actually mean uh, where the biggest change. The lowest part of the troposphere, where the friction with the Earth's surface influences airflow, is the planetary boundary layer. Uh, this layer is typically just only a few hundred meters to two kilometers uh, deep and that depends really much on the on the land form and the time of a day because the behavior obviously changes throughout the day. The bottom um, obviously is at the Earth's surface so the troposphere extends upwards up to 10 kilometers roughly 33,000 feet or 6.2 miles and this is above sea level, that's not above ground. Um, so the highest mountains, the Himalayans, they are not um, breaking through the top end of the troposphere. But just imagine how much the um, consistency of the atmosphere already changes within the troposphere from sea level up to the highest peak of the Himalayans, where you barely can survive without um, oxygen supply. So it, it just shows that the further up you go, um, the much, much quicker um, the density just disappears. So it makes it very, very difficult to even imagine the um, higher atmosphere levels, uh, layers like stratosphere and mesosphere and so on. So the uh, the height of the top of the stratosphere, that also varies um, as we possibly know the, the the earth is not only it's not not a not a perfect sphere it's a little bit indented towards the poles just through the um Coriolis uh, effect and that also affects the atmosphere layers so it's la uh, it's um it's lowest over the poles and the the alt um the altitude of the troposphere is highest at the uh, equator and that also is affected by the season in winter the uh, height is the lowest and in, in summer the atmosphere expands and it gets bigger. It can get as high as 20 kilometers or 65,000 feet near the equator and it can come down as close as 7 kilometers or 23,000 feet over the poles during winter time. Compared to the Earth, we also have 
to understand how incredibly important for life on Earth and unbelievably thin at the same time this one single layer is. And now you compare it to the, to, uh, you remember the scale we, we showed just a little earlier, just compare it to the other atmospheric layers and you get an idea how important that tiny little red dot at the bottom is. It's this it's tiny incredible. little red thing very much at the bottom of this long graphic, yes. And now we are just diving a little bit into the atmospheric flow of the two bottom atmosphere layers, which is troposphere and the stratosphere. The flow of atmosphere generally moves in a west to east direction. That's obviously, as we already um established due to the uh, to the motion to the rotation of earth that can be often interrupted and become interrupted by um by certain effects which we will talk about in a second and that can create a more north to south or south to north flow a number of models are used to explain the the flow of atmosphere around earth and one of them is the three cell model and we have a a graphic also of that, the three cell model of the atmosphere that attempts to describe the actual flow of the Earth's atmosphere as a whole. And by that, it divides the Earth into three um, areas or three regions. We have the tropical region around the uh, equator, then we have the mid latitude and the polar regions. And they are um, defined as the tropical region is called Hadley, the mid latitude is Pharrell. And the polar is polar. That's very easy. And they describe an energy flow on global atmospheric uh, circulation. And the fundamental principle here is that um, the balance, um, the, it's the principle of balance, which kind of means that the energy that the Earth absorbs from the sun each year is uh, equal to what each, uh, what what, <laughs> what is uh, lost to space by radiation. So we are not gaining more mass and we are not losing mass. So this overall Earth energy balance does not apply in each latitude um, due to the varying strength of the sun in each cell as a result of the tilt of the Earth axis. So that's why they um, separated Earth into uh, different regions and you just named them cells. So we have different effects, different impact of the sun, and by that, a different behavior of the atmosphere levels there. So the result is a circulation in uh, of the atmosphere that transports warm air poleward from the tropics and cold, uh, cold air towards the equator from the poles. The effect of the three cells is the tendency to even out heat and moisture in the Earth atmosphere around the planet. And why those cells and those regions are so important is just something that's not easy to explain, but the model has a very nice um, yeah, a very nice gap between the cells. That's an area of convergence where the total mass of air is increasing with time and that results in an increase in pressure at locations below the conversions. So when we talk about low pressure, high pressure systems, that's where it comes into play. Yeah, when, when we have um, an increase in pressure and that just yeah, sucks in um, colder air. An area where the total mass of air is decreasing with time, that results in a falling pressure in that region that's called a divergence area. So it's basically the, the, uh, yeah, the opposite. Where diver divergence is um, occurring in the upper atmospheres um, towards the stratosphere, there will be air coming in and try to balance that loss of mass. As we learned, there is this principle of mass balance. Everything is balanced out. And this results in an upward motion. So basically, that's a positive vertical velocity where air is just sucked up. The opposite effect is what uh, is known from air traffic as so-called air holds. Uh, when an airplane suddenly just uh, loses altitude and just drops uh, a few hundred meters. And um, yeah, one of the reasons why you always should buckle your seatbelts when you're seated. <laughs> 
And it's not really holes in the air. It's more like uh, <laughs> downward drafts that uh, push the plane downwards. Exactly, and and different density due to um, different temperature. Yes. We have a very, or well, we have very, very special features in the um, atmosphere of the polar regions. Of course, we have the cold ice surface and the interaction of the warm air um, aloft from the south that results in a kind of a continuous presence of a temperature in inversion, and that's called the Arctic inversion. It doesn't matter if it's the Arctic or the Antarctic. This is kind of governed by the interacting large scale and um, and local processes, and that means basically surface fluxes and cloud formation that plays a very very big role in the um, atmospheric features of the polar regions. And clouds in the polar regions are not very well um, researched yet. There are a number of recent um, papers out there, which um, I will just post some of them in the show notes. It's really interesting to see that we are um, still in the very beginning of understanding cloud formations in the polar regions. Mm -hmm. When we look at the Arctic, then we just remember it consists of ocean that's surrounded almost entirely by land. And as such, the climate of much of the Arctic is very much moderated by the ocean itself. And for that, we have to understand that the ocean never can have a temperature lower than a negative two degrees centigrade or 28 degrees Fahrenheit. That's one of the uh, very basic features here. So in winter, there's relatively warm water. I wouldn't consider a minus two degrees centigrade warm water, but it's relatively warm. Even though that's covered by the polar ice pack, keeps the North Pole from being the coldest place in the Northern Hemisphere. So we have landlocked areas which are much, much colder because they don't have the warm water underneath to actually heat that up. Um, let me ask and you one question here, which um, I hope doesn't take us too far away from the topic. But I remember reading that um, one of the reasons that our weather up here is so mixed and can be go, can go from really cold to really warm, um, where we live at, again, Germany is around 50, 50 degrees north, um, is because it is so close to that uh, polar cell and because that makes a lot of turbulence and a lot of instable weather. Whereas when you go closer to the equator, um, it's much, much easier to do like a long-term weather forecast over weeks and months maybe. Um, whereas up here, yeah, these influences are much, much stronger because we are closer to these polar cells. Is that the reason for that? That's the reason. And we come to it just in a minute because that's exactly ah, why this polar cell <laughs> model is, is so in, uh, incredible because the, the area between the cells is actually where that happens. And that's okay. exactly where you were leading to. Um, just give me one minute. Oh, sure. Um, sure. I just want to, to show the, the opposite um, to, to the Arctic is the reason for, uh, for Antarctica to be so much colder is just we don't have the underlying warm ocean that heats the planet, uh, that heats the, the, the area. We have the landlocked ice mass there. So that's the reason why Antarctica can get so much colder in Antarctic uh, winter. So remember, we talked about that the coldest temperature measured minus 89.2 degrees centi uh, centigrade and minus 128 degrees Fahrenheit. This is just an incredible temperature, really difficult to to comprehend, at least for me. And I think I, I love the cold, but oh. this is just something out of scale. <laughs> totally. Um, <laughs> what we also see is the difference between the Arctic and Antarctica is Antarctica is a continent which is not connected to, uh, the, uh, to any other landmass. So we have the Southern Ocean circling around that, and that Southern Ocean creates um, a current which is driven by the uh, west wind drift. So by the wind coming from the west, going towards the east um, clockwise here um, due to the rotation of the planet. And that's isolating the uh, continent much, much more. So that keeps the air pretty much tight, trapped in there. That's one of the reasons why climate change has a lesser impact on East Antarctica which is like the big ice sheet, which is 
landlocked, which is on um, solid ground. It's not much in touch with the ocean. So even a warmer um, ocean doesn't really affect the eastern Arctic ice sheet. The western Arctic ice sheet is different just because of the, um, of the, of the fact that it's a marine-based ice sheet. So it's below sea level based. That means the ocean has a direct um, um, contact here with the ice. In the Arctic, it's different. We have the Arctic Ocean in the middle and we have land surrounding it. So we don't really have the a disconnecting here, the disconnection here from, um, uh, from, from ocean and continents. Here, everything is really interdependent much, much more than in Antarctica. And now we are coming to the, the, the barrier between the polar cell and the middle latitude cell. And that's called the polar front. That's exactly the junction between those two cells. And this is a low pressure zone, very relatively warm, very moist. Um, so we have here the much, much warmer and moist air from the uh, Farrell cell, and we have the colder air from the polar cell. And in the graphic um, on the screen, you see a, um, a schematic um, presence of the three cells. That's the three red um, outlines there. And at the edge of each cell, you see a green dot. And those are the, um, the boundaries, the, the, the barriers between the cells. And that's called jet streams. That's a high speed um, highway of air. It's a fast flowing, very, very narrow and meandering air current. And that forces, uh, that, that creates the boundary between the troposphere and the stratosphere. So those jet streams form where there is a large temperature difference between two air masses. That's also one of the reasons why they are not static, but why they are moving, because the cold and warm air is obviously moving. And that happens more often during summer than during winter. And that explains why during um, winter in the Northern Hemisphere, we kind of have a very stable polar vortex uh, over the Arctic. And during summer, when warm air is more intruding and cold air is more released, we have more fluctuation here. The polar jet stream, however, is known as the most powerful jet stream. And we have a little video um, for you somewhere in the facts. Yeah, when you Is scroll that a little one? bit further down. Yes, there, that's the one. Okay. Let's and you see that, that colorful band. That's pretty amazing to see this colorful band around the north. And the reddish, the more reddish you, color you have in there, that's the highest wind speeds in the um, in the jet stream, you see it's getting warmer, so it's more fluctuating. It's and then wobbly. it rips even. It's kind of it's wavier. Very yes. wobbly, yes. And it rips apart. And this ripping apart is what's called the anomaly. This is kind of a, a, a thing that happens rather regular. So the jet stream uh, rips apart and the barrier between the cold and, and trapped Arctic air and the warmer mid-latitude air is just broken. And then the colder air just reaches much, much further uh, south and the warmer air has chances to intrude further to the north. And that is pretty a pretty amazing feature. And this is a, uh, an, a nice visualization again from the NASA visualization studio here. Um, very, very nice to swap over to YouTube to just yeah get this 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 video here. It's it's really great to see. And here they are focusing over North America, which gives you an idea why in certain areas we have certain um temperature or weather phenomena. Pretty amazing. And now to we are see. coming back to the phenomena we described in the very beginning. So normally the Arctic polar air is enclosed by this wind barrier, which is called the jet stream. This polar vortex which is uh, particularly pronounced in winter, extends to the edge of the stratosphere. So it reaches really high up into uh, the atmosphere layers. And here we have a graphic where you see um, the higher you get up in the atmosphere levels, the further you go to the right here on the graphics, the, the more pronounced the 
polar vortexes. So in the high atmosphere, in the stratosphere, it's a very circular uh, polar vortex here. The further you go down in the atmosphere, here in the middle stratosphere, in the lower stratosphere, and finally in the troposphere, you see how it's meandering, how it's, it's kind actually of, gets it falls more, apart more... the lower it goes, right? Exactly, exactly. And that's because the atmosphere here in the troposphere, the, the, yeah, the, the troposphere is much, much more affected by local weather phenomena. So we have a much bigger impact here on local geographics, for example. However, at, uh, sometimes the polar vortex can can really weaken, and that's what we've seen in the in, in the um, picture of the troposphere, and can so much uh, can bulge so much that the Arctic air can actually reach us in mid latitudes and really just spells um, the yeah the, the cold polar air um, into mid latitudes. So every year as we head into autumn, the North Pole starts to cool, but the atmosphere further south is still relatively warm. So it's still receiving energy from the sun. You just imagine the tilt of the planet um, when we come towards autumn, then we turn into polar night in the north. The North Pole receives very, very little sunlight and by that also very little thermal energy. And it cools at, at a much, much faster rate than mid latitudes. The reduction in temperature here also means that the pressure, the gradual pressure, drops over the North Pole tremendously very quickly. In the stratosphere, the process is kind of the same. As the temperature drops over the pole and the temperature difference um, towards the south increases, we have a low pressure area that starts to develop across the stratosphere. It's almost like a very large cyclone that's covering um, the entire North Pole down to the mid latitudes. The polar vortex is present at all levels. That means it goes through all the atmospheres, uh, atmosphere levels here, almost from the ground up. The image, um, the next image we have, where we can see the- Is that the video vortex. that you shared? Oh, no, 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 no. We, we just, um, we just had the- Do we have we, one we more? We just skipped that. No, 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 I, I thought I, I put it in. And I thought, have, this is, this is, there's so much media in this episode that I'm getting completely lost. <laughs> I think we've done, you've done good so you've far. Done, you've done really, really good, exactly. <laughs> so the closer to the ground um, we, we get, um, the more deformed the polar vortex gets. And that's what yes. we, we've seen here in this um, four distinguished um, deformed. layers. I'll, I'll call it wobbly, because that's pretty much what yes, it is. Yes, wobbly, like, wobbly is... Yes, <laughs> exactly. It's, it, it, it describes it pretty, pretty good. This year, however, the polar vortex capers, um, they are going beyond what is kind of normal range. And the interesting thing is here, we actually have for kind of the first time real time data because um, the European Space Agency has um, or has a, yeah, has an, a satellite up there uh, called Aeolus. And Aeolus satellite is the first that is actually able to measure polar winds directly from, from the orbit. And to do this, it sends pulses of UV lasers down and um, measures the spectrum. The strength of the polar vortex is measured by the power of winds. And the, the current analysis that we can see is that the, the vortex has weakened unusually strong since uh, mid-December 2020. And that is kind of an event that can, can be observed in which the polar vortex is split into two parts. And that's something we can see here. That's wonderful where to see we here. We, where we have an anti-cyclone over the Pacific, and now it rips the vortex apart, and then we have suddenly two. And it's a it's just a repetition. You can see how there is a counter cyclone, a counter um, or an anti cyclone um, that actually gains strength on the left side here in the video. The the bright is the cold air, the white yellowish that's the cold air, and you can see how it actually is very well defined. And then this anti cyclone just gets super strong and. It banana feature of the polar vortex it just really stretches it it pushes it further down towards europe and at the same time here we can see the split and we see that one of the 
um, bubbles off the polar vortex affects the east coast of uh, the US, while the rest actually stretches from all over Russia over to, um, to Europe and actually reaches far down into mid latitudes. And this is kind of very, very special um, event happening here. One of the reasons why we have right now this phenomena that's very rare that we have these very strong winter uh, weather effects in both North America and in uh, Europe. I like this it's visualization because it really makes it, I mean, this this really relates to other phenomena that we see with like bubbles on water or smoke in the air and, and these currents kind of influencing each other. This is, this is amazing NASA uh, visualization here from one of their satellites up there. It's cool. It's, it is indeed, yes. So the interesting th thing about this is that um, a few years ago, that scientists have discovered the weakening of the polar vortex and the so-called Berlin phenomena, which we just uh, referred to earlier, which is nothing else but a sudden warming in the stratosphere. And they have actually discovered that both of those, so the polar, um, the weakening of the polar vortex and this Berlin pho uh, phenomena are becoming more and more frequent. A likely cause of this is um, possibly the retreat of the Arctic sea ice and the increasing warming of the North Atlantic. So we, we learn throughout the um, episode about the consistency of the um, atmosphere and what the effects are actually at the bottom layer of the troposphere. And by that, it seems quite of logical that the warmer, warming ocean has quite, a, quite an impact. Because according to the model, the associated influx of um, the heat into the atmosphere, that promotes a sudden warming of the stratosphere. And this is kind of the, the bad thing when both of them come together, when we have the polar vortex weakening in the first place by warmer water, uh, uh, warmer um, atmosphere in the mid latitudes. But at the same time, when we have the sudden warming in the stratosphere. However, we need to understand much, much better whether and to what extent climate change actually uh, intensifies this um, weather phenomena. At the moment right now, it's way too early to draw really concrete conclusions from these um, this year's Aeolus data. But um, yeah, research is already underway and Mosaic Expedition, which we showed in the very first video of this episode, um was one was one of the big um yeah expeditions to actually gain more data more insights here uh, throughout winter which is very rare in the arctic so we need to understand that better that's a conclusion to actually um make better forecasts and to understand what's the impact actually from um warmer climate but i actually thought that's a very very interesting um phenomena happening and just getting a little bit to the ground of it. And I hope we did. I think we did. I, yeah, this. <laughs> I, I think one of the things to remember, and uh, especially now that it's been really cold here up in Germany and now also where you live, it is... Um, it is that to under important to understand that weather and climate are two different things. That um, certainly that because because you hear voices now that go, oh look, it's cold, uh, no global warming, and um, if you understand these bigger things and how they go together, then it becomes very very obvious very quickly that the the climate is not the same as the weather. So uh, with that, thanks everyone for joining. We hope to enjoy this episode. I have. I've learned a few things. Every every time I come out of here with a big aha in my face. Um, so this this um, this is cool. I really enjoyed this. Thank you so much for preparing this, Henry. Um, if you have any remarks, if you want to communicate, we are at curiouslypolar.com. We are everywhere on the on the interwebs, and of course, um, we love to hear from our correspondents. So uh, maybe you can become one. Let us know. Email us get in contact um yeah that was it for this episode as i said we are online um we are no our music is not playing ah anyway so we'll do the <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll do this without the music thanks so much for joining and we'll see you in a week from now until then everyone take care and bye-bye <laughs>